Hey guys, Buildzoid here from Actually Hardcore Overclocking, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Asus Zenith Extreme Motherboard. Um, I will be covering some of the OC features before we get into all the VRMs. There's not really that much on this board. So let's get right into it. Starting off in the top right corner, the board does have two, uh, you know, 8-pin power connectors for the CPU. Um, honestly, for Threadripper, I think this is ridiculous overkill. Um, though AMD actually requires two 8-pin, like, uh, 8-pin and a 4-pin by specification. Even though, technically speaking, like, Threadripper doesn't pull, like, as much power as, like, Skylake X. So even with a overclock, as long as you weren't pushing it too hard, a Threadripper should get away with just one 8-pin, um, without any real issues. Now, obviously, there's no harm in having a whole extra 8-pin, but, uh, yeah, I think that... Uh, this is pretty freaking overkill because Threadripper does not get as power hungry as uh, Skylake X. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's View 37 case. The View 37 focuses on highlighting custom PC builds with its full panoramic window and tinted front acrylic. In our thermal testing, the View 37 performed reasonably well when considering its looks focused build, which is partly thanks to the airflow design and the removal of a bottom power supply shroud. For a balance of looks and performance, check the link in the description below for the View 37. Now, under the eight pins, you find a power uh, power button, reset button. Below that, there's a 24 pin connector, and next to that, you find the uh, this four channel dip switch right here, and that is for enabling and disabling the PCIe slots. Um, and this is basically if you have a you know say a water cooled multi GPU setup or a liquid nitrogen cooled GPU setup, or, you know, you're just incredibly lazy and one of the cards has an issue or there's some kind of pro software problem or for whatever reason, one of the cards uh, does, like you want to disable one of the cards without actually physically removing it from the system, you just flick the switch um, for that PCIe slot and it'll disable that card. So that's uh, that's a pretty handy feature in my opinion. Now, down in the bottom right corner of the board, you also find the sort of the more advanced, extra, like extreme overclocking features. So this right here is the LN2 mode jumper. Um, this will extend like how far you can push voltages. Normally there's like normally ROG boards have voltage limits that are just kind of unsafe. Well, once you put the LN2 jumper into LN2 mode, the voltage limits go from pretty unsafe to completely unacceptable <laughs> so you know you'll never feel voltage limited once you move that over and it's like i'm not really sure why they do it because it's not like outside of ln2 mode the voltages are that much more reasonable under that there is a slow mode switch next to that there is an rsvd slow mode basically immediately uh pushes the uh cpu multiplier to the lowest possible setting uh, very, very handy for uh, basically idling in, uh, like, if you're on LN2, this is really, really handy for putting the system into, like, basically very low power consumption or just for stability so that, you know, in between fine-tuning settings or in between opening benchmarks, saving screenshots, that kind of thing, uh, the system doesn't crash because you're no longer at 5 gigahertz, you're at, like, a gigahertz. So that's what that switch is for right there. Um... There's also this switch, which is the RSVD, and that switch is generally used by ROG motherboards. It basically has, uh, well, that switch basically will have a uh, sort of profile for a whole bunch of voltages to try removed uh, cold bug, uh, cold boot bugs and cold bug issues. Um, I'm not sure how well that works on Ryzen. On the Intel motherboards from Asus, this switch is amazing. It can make, like... For a lot of CPUs, you don't have to actually know anything. You just flick the switch and everything works. Um, it skips a huge part of the fine-tuning process if uh, if this works well. But on Ryzen, running Sub-Zero is a lot more complicated. And so I have suspicions that this might not be quite so flick the switch to look competent because... Even if the switch sets everything up correctly, it might still not work just because Ryzen on LN2 is, well, Ryzen. And therefore, you'll have all kinds of issues even at the best of times. Now, next to that, you get two buttons. Now, these are actually useful for even regular overclockers. 
Um, so this red one right here, that's safe boot. This is super handy if uh, you... Um, well, basically, if for whatever reason the system isn't posting and you don't want to wipe your BIOS settings, you press the safe boot button, it'll boot the system at stock settings, but all of your settings in the BIOS will still be, like, present. And next to that, you get a retry button. This is for getting the memory to retrain um, uh, if you're pushing really hard memory settings. Basically, what the retry button does is it temporarily cuts all power to the motherboard, and that basically wipes the motherboard's training profile for the memory and the motherboard has to essentially relearn how to run the memory. Um, and eventually, if you're lucky, it'll learn how to run it properly and you're, you'll boot like 3733 CL12 or whatever memory settings it is that you're aiming for. And if you're unlucky, it'll just never ever actually get there, even with the retry button. But th this is uh, very, very handy for over uh, for extreme overclockers if you're really like hammering the memory safe boot in my opinion is just handy for everyone um sliding along the bottom edge of the board uh you do get this molex power connector for extra power to the pcie slots because of course the 24 pin only has two plus 12 volt lines and well if you have four very high power consumption like high pcie slot power consumption devices so like 75 watt, 75 watt, and 75, and another 75, uh, your 12 volt pins on the 24 pin are going to go melt down on you. Like, they're literally just going to melt, um, which isn't good. So for that reason, there is this Molex power connector down here. Now, personally, I'm not a fan of the Molex pa of power connector. I think it's like the worst power connector of all the power connectors in a computer. This one sucks the most. Um, it also only adds one 12 volt line to the uh, PCIe slots. So um, if you were doing something really crazy, like say hammering the uh, reference, R like absolutely hammering the overclock on reference RX 480s um, and four of them, I, I don't think this would be enough um, to save the 24 pin or itself. Like it would just blow up both of them. Um, because you, you might end up in a situation where you have like a hundred watts going through every single PCIe slot. And at that point, you'll still overload the, the Molex and the 24 pin at the same time. So, uh, like that is like an extreme, you know, exception kind of case, but, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it's just, there's other boards that use a six pin and I think that's just straight up better. Um, so Yeah. And the board has a postcode. It's unfortunately not actually on the board itself. It's uh, integrated into the heat, uh, well, the I.O. cover, um, which I'm not really a fan of. But uh, yeah, it, it kind of is what it is as long as uh, as long as the, you know, as long as the board has a postcode, I, I can live with it. But um, I'm not a fan of I.O. shields. I usually remove them. <laughs> because uh, they cover up the cooling system. So let's actually take a look at the back of the board and the, uh, oh, well, the RM heatsink is not actually that much better visible here. But yeah, the, the postcode is buried into the IO shield. So if you want the postcode, but no IO shield, uh, it'll be kind of awkward. Anyway, the last feature I wanted to point out on the back of the board is this hole in the CPU socket. So this is basically for putting a thermal probe through the, well, behind the CPU to get a, uh, well, if you're on liquid nitrogen, basically the internal dye sensors stop working. So if you want to see the temperature of the CPU, well, of something closer to the CPU than the LN2 pot, uh, you need this hole in the socket. That's really the only way to do that. So that's why that's there. And it's a it's a standard feature for basically all Asus ROG motherboards. Also, interestingly enough, um, all of the capacitors for filtering the vCore VRM are located on the back of the board as well, because if we go back to the front of the board, there's, you know, there, there's no space right here to add uh, bulk filtering capacitors. So, yeah, that's just kind of an interesting design uh, issue with, uh, with the TR4 socket for Threadripper, because this thing is absolutely freaking massive. 
So that covers the OC features, and we can start getting into the, uh, you know, VRMs, starting with the largest and the most important one, the vCore VRM, located right over here. Now, the voltage controller is uh, over there, and you can't see it. Either way, that chip is a ASP1405. It's a Digi Plus Power, uh, Digi Plus Power branded chip, but it's uh, that that's an Asus rebrand. It's probably an International Rectifier 35201, um, based on the fact that Asus uses this same chip for a whole bunch of very different VRM configurations, all using International Rectifier parts. And there's not that many International Rectifier chips that are relevant currently that would be capable of running the various configuration that Asus uh, uses this chip for. So it's probably a 35201, but uh, it's a, like the, the Asus uh, rebrand name is the ASP1405. Either way, it does support uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 phase output like we have here. And uh, yeah, so this is a true eight phase VRM for vCore. And each of the phases uses a single international rectifier IR3555, Asus's favorite power stage. So that is a 60 amp power stage from international rectifier. It's not particularly intelligent, um, but it is a very solid part. Um, the only thing that's kind of interesting about this 8-phase VRM, really, is that this is a VRM that Asus has been using for ages. Um, basically, this is the same VRM you would see on a Rampage 6 Extreme, a Rampage 6 Apex, a Rampage 5 Extreme, a Rampage 5 Extreme Edition 10, or Rampage 5 Edition 10, I'm not sure if they dropped the Extreme part from that one's name. But yeah, Asus has been kind of recycling this power circuit for a while now. Um, and that's fine, because, you know, there's no reason to fix what isn't broken. Uh, and this power circuit it is, a, is, is actually really, really solid. Um, so let's go through some power numbers for this thing, considering that it is an 8-phase with these 60-amp uh, power stages. So, for Threadripper, at, uh, say, ambient cooling systems, you're going to be looking, uh, so, you know, air cooling, water cooling, um, you're going to be looking at voltages of, like, 1.35 to 1.42 volts. Um, 1.42 being the maximum, 1.35 being sort of the happy place where the CPU is clawed, like, the difference between 1.35 volts and 1.42 volts in terms of actual overclocking, very, very little. The increase in power consumption, rather significant. Um, so this is sort of the, the happy medium voltage. Obviously, this is still going to be pretty hard to cool, because at 1.35 volts, you're probably going to be looking at about 200 amps current, uh, you know, current uh, draw by the CPU which translates to about 270 watts of heat dissipation, which means you're going to need a pretty significant heatsink, but it is still within the realm of what an air cooler can deal with. Um, and for this configuration right here, the VRM would produce about 18 watts of heat on the MOSFETs. So that's not a, you know, that's not a ton of heat. And the VRM heatsink that the board has, especially considering that there's like a little fan that blows through the actual fin stack that hides in the I.O. cover, um, that should be no problem. For 1.42 volts, you'll be looking at maybe around 240 amps. Um, actually, you probably won't even go, like, it probably won't even hit that high. And about 26 watts of heat output. So, again, really not that much. This, power, like, for ambient overclocking, this 8-phase is extremely solid. There's a good reason why Asus has been reusing this 8-phase for like high-end desktop motherboards for ages and ages and ages and ages. It's because it's good. So yeah, no problem handling Threadripper for like uh, ambient daily overclocks, um, especially considering the VRM cooling situation it has. Now, if you start cranking it up though, um, things start to get kind of concerning. Um, but I'm not sure if uh, Threadripper will actually pull that much current at the various settings. So, um, purely theoretical, 300 amps, 1.5 volts, you'd be looking at about 4, uh, 1.5 volts, you'd be looking at about 41 watts of heat. Um, that 
might be a workout for the VRM cooling situation. Um, because uh, that th the main like the main block for the heatsink is still well a block, not a lot of fins in that itself. Of the most of the actual surface area is crammed into the I/O cover, which is going to have kind of restricted airflow, and uh, 41 watts of heat is uh, quite a lot of heat. So I'm not sure how well it'll handle. Like you know, if you're like benchmarking on a big custom loop. Um, well, if you're just running benchmarks, they most like most of them probably won't be long enough to really cause VRM thermal issues because it takes time for the VRM to overheat. Um, but that that is quite a lot of heat, and it could cause some issues for extended workloads at uh, completely unsafe settings for daily usage. And if you were on liquid nitrogen, which I still don't think you're gonna hit this, but um, the limit of what the data sheet makes easy to calculate is 440 amps, 1.8 volts, uh, two, you know, on vCore at this, I, I don't think even on liquid nitrogen, you're actually going to hit that amount of current consumption. But if you did hit that, the VRM would produce about 95 Watts of heat, which is really hot. Um, and, uh, concerning that is, uh, yeah, that is a, you know, that that's no small amount of heat. Um, luckily on liquid nitrogen, this area of the motherboard should be getting like frozen through from the LN2 pot on the CPU. And with uh, Threadripper technically not having a cold bug, uh, like you can run it all the way down to minus 196 degrees centigrade. The main problem is stuff... Uh, kind of stops working on the way and you have memory issues and boot issues and it's kind of a mess but if you know what you're doing you can get the system to run at minus 196 degrees centigrade as just difficult to actually do that and if you do get that running well the, the like the, this entire area of the motherboard is just going to start freezing over pretty quick so the VRM will, you know, be starting out at temperatures that are quite possibly subambient. And as long as the benchmark isn't too long, this won't necessarily be an issue, um, though it is kind of concerning and would probably overwhelm the VRM heatsink eventually. So, yeah. Um, but for, you know, normal users, this VRM is plenty. There's really nothing you need to worry about this, uh, about, like, there's no need to worry about this VRM if you're just going to be running it every single, you know, for a daily system. So, that's nice. And on liquid nitrogen, um, well, if you did really, like, like, Threadripper doesn't hit that high. As far as I know, it maxes out around, uh, sort of 600 watts power consumption it does like it doesn't really like skylake x is a lot lot worse than threadripper when it comes to power draw so yeah i don't like i don't think uh the vrm will actually get as much of a workout um like it won't necessarily hit this kind of uh current output especially not at that kind of voltage even on liquid nitrogen but you know just from a theoretical standpoint, that's what would happen if you did hit that amount of current at that voltage. Um, so that's the vCore VRM. Plenty good enough for what it needs to do. Moving on to the next major VRM, we have the SOC. And that is this group of phases down here, controlled by this chip over there. And that is, again, the ASP1405. The VRM is a one, except this time it's configured for a one, two, three phase design. And the chips used, these guys right here, are uh, Texas Instruments power stages. These are CSD uh, 9737s. And these are rated for maximum 25 amps output. Um, Minor problem here, I don't know how much current the SOC VRM for Threadripper pulls. Um, my, like, based on what Ryzen pulls, it should be between 30 and 42 amps peak um, at 1.2 volts, uh, you know, SOC voltage. And there's really no good reason to go much above that or below, like, well... There is reason to go below that, but there isn't really much reason to go above that. I've not really seen any improvements uh, with my CPUs going like significantly over 1.2 volts. But uh, 
and I don't have a Threadripper system, so uh, like just based on Ryzen, there shouldn't really be much reason to go over 1.2 here. Um, but 30 to 42 amps, and so at 30 amps, 1.2 volts, you're going to be looking at about 5.5 watts of heat, and at 42 amps, about 8 watts of heat. So uh, this could get pretty toasty, especially considering that there's going to be like there's probably going to be a very hot graphics card sitting right over the VRM. So yeah, um, this uh, like I'm not a hundred percent certain about like if I'm happy with this, there's also a good chance that Threadripper doesn't literally pull twice as much SOC current as a Ryzen chip does, and it only, like, I'm basing it off the fact that there's two Ryzen dies in there, so they, they should each pull, you know, the same amount of SOC current, and there's two of them, so twice as much. But if it turns out that it's not pulling twice as much current, then actually this would be non-issue. Um, because you wouldn't be hitting these kinds of current levels and that kind of heat output. Now, 30 amps, 5.5 watts, I think this should be non-issue even with the, the GPU situation, but that 8 watt figure, uh, that that could be uh, problematic. Um, but really, like I, I have no way to tell from just looking at the PCB here. That would need to be tested. Um, but... On the flip side, I don't think there's actually any motherboards with a better SOC VRM out there. So, yeah, it's uh, kind of an interesting situation in that way. Now then, let's move on from the SOC VRM to the memory power, which uh, you get two-phase memory power for both, uh, well, each group of memory slots. So you get, you know, one two-phase right here, split like that. And that's controlled by this chip. And on the other side, you get the same thing, that chip and these uh, two phases. So what chip is that? That is a, another one of these Asus rebranded uh, DG, Plus power, uh, DG Plus power controllers, which is a, uh, this one's an ASP1103. I have no idea what that actually is. It does seem to integrate all of the gate drive for the actual memory uh, VRM. So the two-phase memory VRM, on the other hand, I, well, actually, the, even the two-phase memory VRM is actually kind of a mess. So the specific, like the exact MOSFETs that are used here, I can't get the data sheet for them. But they're apparently very, very close in specification to Nyko Semiconductor, and they are Nyko parts. Like Nyko Semiconductor does make these. It's just like a slightly different skew. So these are Nyko uh, PK. Well, the close, you know. No, not PK, PE series, um, PE 616BAs uh, are the uh, chip, like the MOSFETs I'm basing the power figures for this thing off of. Um, and Nyko Semiconductor has a terrible reputation because they make pretty garbage MOSFETs. But the thing is... Um, DRAM doesn't need, a, like, DDR4 and even DDR3 doesn't really need a lot of current, like, a lot of power. So, using, you know, Nyko, small Nyko semiconductor MOSFETs for, uh, for memory power, I don't see an issue with that, and there's a reason for it. Um, if you do have four memory sticks, you're going to be looking at about, um, you're going to end up with something like 8 watts for the whole memory group because each stick is about 2 watts um, at most. And, uh, well, 8 watts at, you know, 1.35 1 volts, you're going to be looking at an average current of about 6 amps, um, which with this two-phase VRM translates into about 1 watt of heat. Uh, there's literally no reason to worry about that at all. Like that is, that's going to cool itself passively just through the surface area of the chokes and the PCB itself. So yeah, this, this like th this is another one of those uh, Asus recycle, Asus ROG re lo loves to recycle their circuits VRMs um, because they've been using a very, very similar two-phase VRM again for ages. There is a whole bunch of motherboards using basically this VRM with uh, incremental updates to which MOSFET and incremental upgrades to the power stages, possibly the voltage controller, uh, 
though I do believe that they all range, like they all end up ranging from 300 to 500 kilohertz anyway. Um, so yeah, and all of them are two phase. So yeah, th this is another one of those Asus recycles, but at least you know that this VRM works and never had issues in the past. So to sum it up, the Zenith Extreme uh, overall, solid board um the soc vrm i'm not entirely sure about but that's mostly because i'm not entirely sure about quite how much current it actually needs to provide the v core vrm for threadripper is completely acceptable um even though this is like an old old like this is a vrm design that asus has been running for literally ages um admittedly like there's been some tweaks and upgrades to it over the years but it's basic like the the asus high-end mother like uh high-end motherboard vrm since like lga 2011 the original lga 2011 i don't mean the haswell e version i mean the sandy bridge e version like the 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 high-end vrm for those boards has been eight 60 amp internet uh 60 amp power stages from international rectifier and whatever voltage controller is relevant at the time that does eight phases and asus has been basically doing that um well, since LGA 2011, because 2133, uh, 2011-3 is basically this, uh, 2066 is this, this Zenith is this, um, so, yeah, but on, on the Zenith, this, this is completely adequate, um, on X299, I, I find this, uh, somewhat, uh, concerning, but at least on Threadripper, like, Threadripper is not as bad as Skylake X in terms of power consumption, so I don't have any complaints for the V-Core VRM here, um, memory power is, you know, sta standard Asus, there are motherboards out there with much, much more expensive MOSFETs for their memory power, but, again, it's like, these you know these nyco parts are doing one watt you're you're not like it doesn't matter if you push it down to half a watt like no the margin of error for most testing equipment like if you're measuring system power that's going to be margin of error so memory power absolutely no complaints the feature set on the motherboard is solid the fact that they decided to put the freaking postcode into the io io cover i find uh kind of inconvenient but Overall, really, really solid board. If you're looking at this thing for a daily system, uh, there's not really anything to complain about, at least that I can see. Um, so, yeah. That's the Zenith Extreme. Um, hopefully, the Zenith 2 Extreme will turn out to be just as good or possibly better, but knowing Asus, they're probably just going to slap the same VRM on it again. Um Unless Threadripper turns out to pull like twice, like a kilowatt on, well, no, because that'd be uncoolable. Yeah, unless Threadripper suddenly gets a lot more power hungry, Asus is not changing that VRM for a while. So th this this is quite possibly going to be a good reference even against the Zenith 2 Extreme because uh, I'd be surprised if they didn't just recycle all of these power circuits again. Um, but again, they work really well, so it doesn't really matter. And that's it for the video. Uh, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment down below if you got any questions. And if you'd like to support what we do here with Gamers Nexus, uh, there is a Patreon link down in the description below. If you'd like to see more, uh, you know, overclocking focused content, I have a, another channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking where I do a lot of hardcore overclocking. That's it for the video. Thanks for watching and see you next time.